yeah, man. So I'm, I'm just, usually I just jump into these things. If you're ready, if you don't have any, you know, pre questions or anything like that. No, uh, let's just jump into it. Let's roll. Uh, well, first of all, man, thanks for, for taking the time. I I'm sure you're an extremely busy guy. Um, of course I've heard you on other podcasts and really appreciate uh, your perspective and the way you articulate things. I think you're one of the best uh, in the business at um, articulating many of the very important components of, of this stuff and giving it the proper context so that people can understand it um, in the way that it, it probably should be understood and dis dispelling a lot of uh, a lot of the FUD that comes along with this stuff. So uh, very excited for, for today's discussion. But for people that uh, in, in my audience that maybe aren't familiar with you or your work at Unchained, uh, maybe we can get the, uh, the Coles Notes kind of background and biography and then we'll, we'll take it from there. Yeah, sounds good. Well, um, glad to join and appreciate you having me on. And I think, you know, kind of, you know, just first, you know, when I, um, you know, first got into Bitcoin, I was, I was working at a hedge fund at the time, um, doing, you know, global macro research, uh, really um, actually had the, you know, the fortune of being able to meet Safe Dean Amus, um, kind of really, I don't know if you want to say serendipitously, but it wasn't related to Bitcoin. Um, but, but, you know, he was really, you know, someone very early on that helped me understand a lot of dynamics around monetary economics and, and then just through independent research that I was doing on the Fed, things just started to click for me, um, you know, related to Bitcoin and ended up uh, leaving what I was doing. Uh, that was in 2017. Um, didn't really take a year off, but just took time to, to really go further down the, the Bitcoin rabbit hole. Um, ended up meeting um, Joe Kelly and Drew Bonsell, the, the two co-founders at Unchained, um, just after I moved back to Austin. And, uh, you know, kind of really wasn't looking to do something at that time. Um, but, you know, we continued to have conversations, uh, exchanged ideas, and then they asked me to, to join and come help uh, build out Unchained. Um, so, you know, really, you know, at Unchained, you know, we, we really think of ourselves as a Bitcoin native financial services company. Um, so, um, you know, we, we view the world uh, as one in which Bitcoin is money um, and that the, the logical things to, to provide and, and that, you know, what we need ourselves. And that's really kind of one, one of the ways that we think about it. What are things that we need? What are things that people that we know need? And then just more generally, as we think about the trajectory of Bitcoin, you know, if Bitcoin is money, then the thing that people need are financial services. And uh, how do we do that in a way that maximizes the strengths of the Bitcoin protocol? Um, and so um, while we're not a bank, um, you know, you know, I like to think of ourselves as, as you know, the future of what a, a Bitcoin private bank will look like. Uh, we just do it in a way that's native to Bitcoin that, um, you know, and that means in, in the case of custody, we, um, you know, we are not a custodian. We provide technology and services that help people better secure their Bitcoin through multi-signatures such that they can control their private keys. Um, it's a really kind of foundational idea of our company that, um, you know, not only Bitcoin, but individuals achieve better security outcomes, the more people that have keys. Um, and then, you know, we also provide lending. Uh, so for, for people that um, need dollar loans or, or dollar liquidity, um, we secure Bitcoin, issue loans, and then, you know, when the loan is repaid, we return the Bitcoin. Uh, but as Unchain evolves, it will really be, you know, kind of evolving the suite of services um, and, and really tailored to kind of what is in demand uh, as Bitcoin evolves. So, um, you know, we are working on the ability for people to uh, buy and sell directly into to cold storage multi-sig vaults. Uh, we haven't yet released that, uh, but, but, but just, you know, really thinking about any traditional service that a bank offers, Unchain will offer in the future, um, but just kind of tackling each different item at, you know, where we see the most acute needs and the most demand in the market. Yeah. And that's been, you know, clear and Unchained has offered, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, a lot of really, uh, you know, just products that make sense and that are very kind of usable and in need uh, in the community. I know Caravan was a, a release, I think, a few months ago, right? And this is just making it easier to basically interact with multi-sig and, and um, you know, and, and that's something that a lot of people haven't done yet, uh, but there probably will be more demand for it in the future. But I wanted to ask, um, what... I don't know much about how Bitcoin backed loans work. And I think a lot of people may be in the same boat. Can you just kind of tell me the mechanics of how that works? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll explain that. And then I do want to come back because you didn't mention Caravan because that, that is a big piece that I didn't mention that, that's core to 
what, what it is that we're doing. Um, on yep. the Bitcoin, Bitcoin backed loan side, um, so you know, generally for people that have, you know, you know, a, you know, a material amount of Bitcoin, you know, been in Bitcoin for a long time, uh, generally, uh, you know, have a, a higher net worth, but a lot of it's derived from Bitcoin, um, you know, kind of see the, the happening coming or just realistically over time, recognizing that Bitcoin is a, uh, is a finitely scarce resource and, and rather than sell that Bitcoin today and, and, you know, have potential tax consequences of that, uh, people can take loans from us. Uh, when they do, um, you know, we, we offer, a, you know, essentially they provide um, uh, 200% of the, the, the advanced loan balance or we, we advance funds at 50% LTV. So if somebody wants, uh, you know, our minimum loan side is, is $10,000. If, if somebody wants a $10,000 $10, loan, individuals would post $20,000 worth of Bitcoin. The way that we do that is each individual uh, loan and each individual client has its own multi-sig vault with Unchained, and the Bitcoin is held in that vault and can be auditable on chain throughout the duration of a loan. Um, you know, as the price of Bitcoin fluctuates, uh, if the price rises, then uh, and, and hits a certain threshold, that will then will release a certain amount of Bitcoin to uh, either an unencumbered Unchained vault or to any you know wallet address that. Um, a, a client you know, provides to us, but then on the, the reverse side, if the price drops, uh, there are certain uh, collateral maintenance requirements. So um, say the, the, you know, the loan starts out with a $10,000 loan and $20,000 worth of Bitcoin. If the price of Bitcoin drops 25%, such the collateral's 15, that worth 15,000, then we issue a collateral maintenance call and individuals will have to post additional Bitcoin to um, to allow that loan to remain outstanding. If they don't, in a in a certain period of time, which in our case is two days, uh, expires, then we will um, partially liquidate collateral to to get it back to the threshold that it needs to be. Um, but you know, it's a very transparent process. Again, it, there are risks involved. Um, there, you know, um, with extreme volatility, you know, we can be placed in a position where we have to liquidate collateral. Uh, but really, it is tailored for people to to use conservatively. Um, to, to access dollars, preserve their Bitcoin, um, and kind of you know the the trade off of that is is the interest cost, but uh, but yeah we we also in terms of the custody model we do offer two two options so if uh, and the one that we prefer our clients to use for those that are comfortable with self custody which many of our clients are uh, we offer an arrangement where um, it's a two or three multi sig vault where the Bitcoin is held collateral is never rehypothecated um, and uh, the client actually gets to hold one of the keys. So not only can they validate on chain that there is Bitcoin in the address, but they can also validate that it is unique to them, or at least that one of their keys is there. Um, Unchained controls the second key, and then we have a third party partner control the third key. So, um, you know, we, we ultimately are in control through our third party, uh, but we really take, um, in, in, in many ways throughout everything that we do, measures to um, engineer around edge cases and reduce unchained or minimize unchained as a single point of failure as it relates to our interactions with clients. Yeah. And so how do you, how does unchained, you know, uh, perform this basically, you know, how do you, how does unchained make money uh, in offering these loans? Like how do they, how do they provide this service? So, um, you know, our, our loans bear interest, you know, again, and I would say if somebody has the ability to go get a traditional traditional fiat mortgage at, you know, three or four percent, um, they should do that over taking an unchained loan. Um, our our capital is is provided by, you know, kind of private capital providers. So um, we we charge interest of 10 to 14 percent. So we make, we, you know, in terms of the loans, we make interest or, you know, we earn principally through two ways origination fees which generally range from um, 0.5 percent to one percent of a loan balance as well as servicing fees and and then the ultimately the interest on the loans right so you, you let's say you guys charge one percent a month on on a loan something oh no so uh, a loan so our our interest rates they vary depending on the duration of the loan but uh, our shortest duration loan now uh, there are no prepayment penalties, but the, the shortest duration loan we issue is three months, um, and the longest duration loan we issue is three years. There can always be exceptions, uh, but the interest rates on those vary from approximately 10% to 14%. Right, and so with that collateral, you get the capital from 
elsewhere and that's what you that's the cash basically that you give to clients yeah yeah and then they they fund that you know 10 to 14 percent interest in in dollars yeah um all right i'll if you wanted to to touch on caravan because uh, i got a bunch of other stuff for you but i'll let you break yeah. into that for a sec if you'd like yeah i did i did want to come back to caravan and i can't believe i forgot about it because pro caravan probably has been our single largest investment over the last say six to nine months um and you know care you know one is as a firm we we recognize that there are privacy trade-offs to working with a company like unchained i think something else that you you brought up um is that you know people are just starting to use and interact with multi-sig at least at an individual level i think you know uh, any institution that's providing custody on behalf of, of clients um, in, a, in a third party sense, you know, those institutions all generally use multi-sig. But in, in terms of an individual application, um, you know, realistically up until the last 12, 18 months, many individuals weren't. And so we're, we really are in this phase of, you know, educating um, people on, you know, better ways to secure their Bitcoin, which I think is, a, you know, especially as the price of Bitcoin increases over time and it becomes a more material, material percentage of people's wealth, the idea of holding a lot of Bitcoin on a single key becomes you know, uh, scarier or presents greater risk. And, and while we're in that process, kind of thinking about the problem from the perspective that you know, many people you know, don't yet know how multi-sig works. Um, and, and other people um, have reasonably have concerns on, on the privacy side that we want, you know, through our platform, be able to provide multi-sig to everybody. Um, so whether somebody is comfortable using a third party like Unchained or um, just using uh, an open source application, we want the, that bar to be lower or lowered such that everyone can access that. We think it's a really important part to kind of, not, not the long-term viability of Bitcoin, Bitcoin is viable regardless, but it will, give more people confidence, the more secure they are, it, that, that their Bitcoin isn't at risk or at risk of being hacked. And so, you know, kind of Caravan's a tool that, that allows people to interact with multi-sig that don't necessarily want to work with a third party. Um, again, the benefits of Unchained is that, you know, you, our, our clients can, can control two out of three keys. So they're sovereign over their private keys and they can move their Bitcoin without any, any help from Unchained. And Caravan, you know, for, for them provides an important tool. For people that, that don't interact with Unchained, uh, people can just use Caravan, but for people that use Unchained, Caravan represents a way that if they ever wanna spend money without you know, accessing Unchained's private application or accessing anybody you know, within Unchained or requiring any help, they can go completely external to us to, to be able to facilitate that. So that, 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 that you know, kind of has two-sided functions. But then in addition to that, over time, um, as, as we're already seeing it, Caravan's a tool to help us accelerate development within our private application um, so that you know, we wanna get to a point where we're you know, using the exact same libraries in Caravan within our private application. Um, and you know, we also want it to be a tool to, um, for other developers in the community, as well as other companies to be able to leverage, but also to help drive multi-sig standards. I think that if there is a, um, if there is you know, I don't want to say a risk to multi-sig, but I think one of the one of the drawbacks of multi-sig is that you know across different hardware providers, um, and, and even per, across different companies, um, multi-sig is still emerging in terms of its individual or client-facing application. And um, in order for us to achieve the the level of security that we can through multi-sig, developing better standards is an important part of that. And so, um, kind of in in our world, Caravan. While people can kind of look at it and say, well, you know, how does how does um, Unchained make money off of Caravan? Realistically, it's a multifaceted asset for us. It's the asset on the private application. It's an asset for our clients within our private application. It's an asset for people that don't want to interact with a third party, um, and and it's also a development tool. So we have a test suite that other developers, whether they are you know hardware wallet uh, manufacturers, can come in and use and see, hey, does my is my wallet is my wallet able to sign a multi-sig address through a browser? So um, it, it really is kind of a, a long-term investment, and we continue to advance it. We're, we're going to be pushing a big release to that um, next week. We were planning to do it this week, but that'll come next week, and then there'll be a, a lot more functionality. So Caravan really is a critical piece to the story of what we're building with Unchained because the foundation is all built around multi-sig. Yeah, 
That's awesome, man. How many people do you guys have roughly at Unchained? Um, roughly about 18. Um, I, I would have a better count, but you know, we haven't been, you know, at the office for the last <laughs> eight weeks. Right. And, uh, but I think we're still at 18, maybe. 19. Yeah. Um, I know part of your background, at, at least, you know, you come from the traditional world. You were at Heyman Capital, you know, Kyle Bass, a pretty well-known uh, figure. What do he and, you know, potentially other former colleagues think about the work you're doing now and, and, and maybe Bitcoin generally? Are they supportive, intrigued, dismissive? I would say that, it's hard to put a number on it, but I, I would say, um, 80% intrigued, 20% dismissive, um, and that, you know, you know, specifically, you know, you know, I've had a number of conversations with Kyle on Bitcoin. I think he's, you know, I, I, I'm not yet sure whether or not he has any exposure to it, but um, I think, you know, he, you know, he is someone who I, I would say is pretty um, reflective of a, of a number of people that, you know, kind of look and operate in that world that is intrigued, like understanding that there is value in, you know, you know if Bitcoin were, really, you know, I think this is the primary question that most people have and that, you know, so certain people struggle with, if Bitcoin really has achieved finite scarcity, that that is a very valuable, um, that is a very valuable thing. Um, and then I think where, um, you know, some of that intrigue then kind of, not necessarily gets shut down, but I think where there's a pause most frequently is the the regulatory environment. You know, I think there's a, a broad concern around, you know, the the traditional investment community. There's a there's a, there's a view that, you know, if Bitcoin is as successful as it can be, that you know the Fed or the Treasury or the government, military, whoever it may be, that they'll just shut it down. And uh, and you know, in my conversations with those type of people, and I. I really, I wrote um, one of my articles on Bitcoin cannot be banned, um, kind of really thinking about that audience of people that kind of has that view that to explain to them why, um, why it's, it, it's not necessarily irrational to, or, or illogical to think about, but when you, when you parse through that type of thought process, you, you quickly recognize that um, the, the asymmetry, it's like, you know, Bitcoin only gets banned if, or I don't think it can be banned, but uh, the attempts only, you know, materially start if Bitcoin is, you know, probably an order of magnitude more valuable. Um, and, you know, the more that you understand the fundamentals about Bitcoin, the more you understand why, even if they attempted to ban it, uh, it wouldn't work. But even then, if you came back and said, okay, well, would I rather have, if I look at this and I believe that it's viable, that there's a, that, you know, having a currency that with a fixed supply is va of value. Um, and that uh, a Western government isn't going to really try to crack down on it until it's very apparent that it's a problem for their monopoly over money. Would you rather, in a, you know, would you rather be exposed to that asymmetry if you had some baseline of knowledge, and or would you rather be in a position to not have the, any of that asset that increased by an order of magnitude for the fear that you know your ability to use it may you know may be impaired? And so in my world, it's I you know. 10 times out of 10, I'd rather be the person having that problem than not having the thing that the government wants to restrict. For sure. And my, one of my questions with these guys, and obviously they're, they're incredibly bright and informed and experienced. Um, but one of the things that I bump up against is that if, you know, Bitcoin is for whatever reason, not that interesting to you, or maybe you haven't really just dug your teeth into it yet. When you look out on the, the world today, especially in light of the last couple months, but certainly, you know, over the last number of years, and you see the problems, you see the cracks emerging, you see the inherent unsustainability of it all. What do these people uh, think is the end game, if not um, something like Bitcoin, which represents, you know, effectively a, an alternative system? What, what do they think is going to transpire? Because a lot of them are, are rightfully, in my opinion, bearish on on what's going on and, and, and they're accurately articulating the problems, but what do they see in terms of a solution if not Bitcoin? Yeah, you know, I, I think that there's probably two, two different views that I've seen formed. Um, and, it, and one is, you know, people increasingly recognizing 
that you know kind of a combination of two two thought processes none of this makes sense and this all ends badly and then they don't carry that out to the to the logical conclusion and i think in 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 certain ways it's because um it's uncomfortable to think about that like you know people because you know the fed is the fed and the treasury is the treasury in the united states is the united states they they can't really even take themselves to go through that thought process to say could the dollar ever not be the dollar um and that rather than go down that you know kind of path you know kind of logically or kind of consistently it just kind of shuts down at that point they they recognize that this doesn't work or that something's wrong and that something's going to end badly but it never extends to a world where the dollar isn't the predominant currency in the world because that just is difficult to imagine or uncomfortable to think about i think that the other view is you know someone who recognizes that and then logically says you know we'll probably go back to a gold standard you know, rather than than go to Bitcoin, and mm -hmm. and I have I've got I have two problems with that, which is you know if it ever becomes apparent that there's a problem with fiat money, which again it's like people look at the dollar and they look at Venezuela and they don't they they, they view them as two entirely separate animals when the actual currency and what underpins the currency is identical. You know, yes, there's a different central bank and a different government, but at a root level, what underpins the currency, the operation in which it's created is identical to Venezuela. I mean, it's just, they're just one person away. You know, people, you know, um, Milton Freeman was someone who, you know, get, gets a lot of praise, but then he was one of the original monetarists that said, okay, if we just put a little bit of money supply in, you know, this will be good. Um, well, then somebody comes along and puts in, you know, 1.8 trillion and then 600 billion and then, you know, another, 1.8 trillion and then this time just in the last six weeks 2.4 trillion so it's like the, the actual operation is the same but there's a disconnect between recognizing that venezuela over here and what happened to their currency as if it can't happen to the dollar um, and so you know i think that you know what if you take venezuela as an example you know if you ever get to a point where fiat currency is readily apparent that that it doesn't have value you can't magically then take gold and say okay the, the this bar of gold is now you know what guys we're going to set it at eight thousand dollars an ounce because you know that's the current what it's currently trading at or whatever it is like assuming that the, that the dollar falls apart um because everyone looks at that and says wait what changed about the operation of creating dollars that i now am suddenly going to trust that it's just it's just not a logical uh, place to end up it's that if if the problem becomes apparent, the cat will be you know too far out of the bag to put it put it back in. And I think at this point probably isn't already is, and people just haven't figured it out. Um, and then and then the other thing I have the other problem that I have with kind of that that gold story is that where we got today is really a, like in my view the a manifestation of gold's failure as a monetary medium. Like we already had gold, and then we got to this point. And we got to this point because you know gold was you know, you know in order to uh, you, know, you know maybe one way to think about it is you know in order to commercialize gold or to make it form to the economy that was emerging around it the technological solution to that was put gold in vaults and create you know uh, bank notes and ultimately reserve notes or dollars um, and, and and when you when you start to understand Bitcoin then you start to understand that it's it's perfected the scarcity of gold and it's essentially kind of combined all of the benefits of the digital dollar with all the benefits of the physical scarcity of gold into one you know it's not digital gold it's the digital dollar and physical gold combined and so when i think about bitcoin vis-a-vis -vis gold you know i really think about it and again it's easy for for someone like myself who's been sitting and staring at the problem you know for three years three four years uninterrupted um, but that, you know, in my view, Bitcoin is an order of magnitude better than gold. That's why, you know, its adoption rate relative to gold is, you know, is of civil, you know, similar degrees. Um, so I think that, you know, but I also recognize 
And I think this is where you know many traditional institutional investors um, fall down, and very reasonably, is that you know, like I kind of think about you know a metaphor or analogy to like somebody staring at a blank canvas, and it's completely unintuitive, and then something just clicks for people and again it's different for every person uh, or maybe not different for every person but it can take many different variants that suddenly what you were you were staring at this you know knowing that you needed to understand it but it just you know it just didn't make sense and then something happens and it's likely some experience or some idea that connects and then it's a masterpiece it's like the sistine chapel you just see it it was always there but you couldn't see it because it wasn't intuitive. But then once you see it, you can't unsee it. Um, and and so you know, in many ways, um, and I'm working on a piece now that's just on common sense and you know, kind of you know, experience being greater than reason. That you know, you like Bitcoin's almost a problem you can't think about harder. It just has to make sense someday, and that probably only happens because you read something that made you think about something that you wouldn't have otherwise thought about, or you see something like you know, the Fed create $2.4 trillion and you're like, okay, I get it. You know, 21 million, 2.4 trillion. You know, so um, it's like, I try not to, um, you know, beat up people too much that, that don't see it because I know that I was there myself. I spent two years looking at Bitcoin before it clicked for me. Yeah, I mean, I think it's very much like that. It's like a eureka moment. And then after that, you know, there's still a lot of learning to be done. But the more learning you do, I mean, you know, I'm, 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 oftentimes I just think to myself, it's so obvious. How is this not like clear and obvious to everybody? Um, but one of the things, you know, you mentioned, and I've been engaging the gold bugs a little bit more lately because talk about obvious. There seems to be a weird dissonance where the gold bugs don't seem to realize that the reason why we're in this mess is because of the deficiencies of, of gold's properties as money in the first place. And that cash was gold scaling solution. And it's, it's inexorably linked to a, a, a trust, a trusted scaling solution is necessary for gold to scale. And it will always be that way, especially in the modern world and modern commerce. And there's just no way of avoiding the pitfalls that we've, you know, there's so many examples of through history and the largest of which we're probably living through right now. And just the, the dissonance, the hubris, whatever you want to call it, to not realize that is one of those things that I just can't, it's hard, like, I don't understand why they can't see that. Yeah, you know, I, I you know, my, my view of that, because I, I think about that as well. And just as people who think that the fiat system is operating and that it works and we can do, you know, MMT, which is a made up thing and, you know, all reality can, you know, not apply, um, that, you know, similar pitfalls exist for, for people that, that, that are interested in gold and that, um, you know, that's anchored in time. You know, gold's been around for 2000 years. Uh, or more than that, you know, like for the existence of the world, but in terms of, in terms of its monetization. And so um, I think that that anchoring in time, um, you know, they, they basically saw that, you know, what happened, you know, in 1933 and 34 and 1971, all of that didn't make sense. And they were right, right? And uh, if, if not for Bitcoin, we would go back to that world. But they also haven't spent time to independently really understand Bitcoin in most cases. I mean, certainly, you know, many of them have, and there, there is a crossover. So it's not suggesting like there's a fine line, but that I think in the ones that, that continue to fail to see it, they, you know, they, they kind of anchor to this idea of, well, there's this mining process that constantly has to go. And once you get a bar of gold out of the ground, that, you know, it's good. Um, and, and, and we don't have that ongoing maintenance cost. And it's like, well, um, you do have ongoing maintenance costs. You've got, you know, higher cost of facilities and vaults and, uh, you know, you are constantly going and getting more, um, more gold out of the ground, uh, which is a cost to the existing gold that's in place, even if it's, you know, one and a half to 2% a year. And what it will turn out to be is that the cost to secure the Bitcoin network you know, will be less than 1%. Uh, even when you get to a set steady state, and we're just talking about transaction fees, 
It's just what that we've seen over time, the you know, mining revenue share in terms of the overall Bitcoin economic system continues to go down and down you know, on a percentage basis. <clears throat> so I think we'll ultimately come around to that idea, but I do think that um, you know, it, it, it starts at the idea because it is Bitcoin is so hard to, to understand and so much of what somebody who's spent you know, years, decades, like understanding the issues in the fiat system and knowing that the solution was gold. But that's a very difficult um, thing to tell them that, you know, yes, you were right that, you know, what happened, you know, was a problem and that gold was the better solution then. But now there is this thing that's perfected on all the things that gold did. Um, yeah. And you need to understand how and why that is in order to then, you know, divorce from the idea that, that that we'll just go back to gold. But until you see kind of how and why Bitcoin you know beats gold by an order of magnitude, you just you just can't get there. And, for, and me myself, I was somebody, and I had the fortune of you know when I met Safe, I was actually diligencing a gold company, and um, and and the guys who run it are incredibly knowledgeable both about gold and Bitcoin, um, and, and people that I learned a lot from, but also through Safe. I, that's really when I went through the process of learning monetary economics, and I was somebody who looked at gold, didn't understand it, thought it was, you know, someone who would have referred to gold as a barbaric relic. You know, if I ever need gold, I'd rather have guns and cows. Um, right. And then I figured out that I was like, no, well, the reason why gold or more kind of generally money exists is to uh, allow civilization to, to to coordinate peacefully, and that if we do have a good form of money, then we won't need the guns, type of an idea. Um, and so. I was someone that latched on to gold and I started buying some gold because I hadn't yet got Bitcoin. And then I was, I was stuck in this world where I kind of understood Bitcoin, but I understood gold and I was seeing like how, you know, kind of, was there some way that gold, you know, Bitcoin would sit on top of gold and be like the digital piece of it. And then it just clicked for me one day where I was like, no, like it's Bitcoin has that same inherent scarcity. It doesn't need gold. Um, and, and so I kind of, you know, went from zero to gold, to Bitcoin in, you know, in 60 seconds, you know, where <laughs> there was practically like probably like, you know, three months or six months where I was hung up on gold. But, uh, um, I, you know, I think it's just, if, if, if you, if you started from scratch, you probably more logically go that path. Um, but if you've been anchored to gold for years, you know, it, you know, it's a similar challenge. than if you're, you know, wed to the fiat system and think that it's, you know, smooth sailing and well-functioning. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And, you know, on that point, man, monetary history and understanding um, the nature, complexity, and implications of money is, I just find, once you realize what it represents, it's such a compelling kind of field or subject matter for, for study because it's, it, it innervates everything. I mean, it, it literally is the determining factor on the type of world that we, uh, that we live in collectively. And um, it's such a rich pursuit. And I think, you know, the gold bugs, um, I think they, they, they've kind of truncated that, that understanding and they've kind of taken a, a sliver of it and focused on that and, and left out the, the larger picture. But on the flip side, I can almost, you know, I can relate or I, I, I'm a little bit more, um, gentle on them sometimes because and i think safe's book really brought this home for a lot of people the idea of absolute scarcity um and it, it it is a bit of a chasm to cross for people to to realize that one that's something that can even exist uh and it can exist in the digital world i mean so many people are just completely averse to the 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 notion that something can be scarce in in the digital world you know the gold bugs always refer to the fact that um you know gold is corporeal you can feel it you can touch it it's there it's you know not going anywhere and to to cross that uh, bridge to realizing that scarcity has been established in the digital realm digital digital realm it's it will likely continue to persist and that that's the nature of that scarcity is absolute you know, I can I can get that that's a, a big pill to swallow and takes a bit of time to to digest. Yeah, and I think that there is that you know because th there's always examples though where like I think people look at Bitcoin and you know because you know, in my own personal experience figuring out how 
um, you know, and again, there's no, like, I couldn't explain it in one sentence how Bitcoin, you know, ach achieves finite scarcity. But through that process of like figuring out, you know, how all the nodes in the network validate transactions, how blocks are constructed and, and joined together or, or sequenced together, how other, you know, kind of miners, you know, validate um, and that whole process, like down to, you know, kind of like literally block construction and nonces, like that was where like my mind really just like, you know, it was where my mind blew, you know, or as my mind was blown, um, where I was like, holy shit, like, I get it, like, that's crazy. Um, but, you know, I think that from, from the outside looking in without having that, you know, kind of knowledge base, that there's this idea that you have this, you know, network running, and that just like any data center, like a data center could go down and be disrupted. Uh, and so they, they, they think of it as something that's kind of like constantly on a loop, and anything that's constantly on a loop can be shut down um, versus a bar of gold that there's permanence to it, you know, where, you know, it's static in the world. Um, it doesn't mean that its utility is, but that it, that it still exists there as an object. And so, um, you know, the more that they understand about, you know, not only how decentralized Bitcoin is today, but then also just that it, you know, by its very nature becomes, you know, as Bitcoin expands by an order of magnitude, whether it's adoption or value or however you want to look at it, there's more nodes in the network. It's like basically becoming more and more redundant constantly that, that there really is permanence to that. Um, and that it's not just, you know, a, a you know, server farm that could go down somewhere. Um, or they look at keys and they say, oh, well, you know, keys can be lost. It's like just something digital, this gold bar, like you could, um, you know, you can't destroy it. But, you know, they're, they're looking in a world where the whole gold monetary system already evolved. You know, and that's one of the other things that people struggle with with Bitcoin. It's like I see Bitcoin, I'm like, I get it. It's going to be perfectly stable in about 10 years, uh, but about six people, six, six billion people between now and then need to adopt it before that's going to happen, or maybe two billion or three billion. Um, but I already see that end game, and so you know, I understand the volatility and why it is and how to manage it. Um, but in that world, there's so many things that haven't been built in Bitcoin that like. Once Bitcoin is worth a trillion dollars in total, we're going to have a lot more capital and a lot more companies building things for Bitcoin. Um, and if we take gold, we go back to the role that at some point there was a piece of ore in the ground. There were no coins. There were no well-manufactured coins. There were no banks that had bank vaults. That all of those things evolved as people recognized the value of gold and figured out how to optimize um, it as money. Like they had to take the the ore and convert it into a monetary medium. And that's the same thing in Bitcoin. Like think of Bitcoin as the ore, and now we're building the monetary system on top of it, or at least the rails to be able to move it around and to transact in it. Um, and so, you know, I think it's, it's some kind of, like, it, I don't wanna say it's not fair, it's unrealistic to not, to not think that way about Bitcoin, to not say, okay, you know, if I give you that there's digital scarcity here, and that that's actually been achieved, regardless of how mind blowing that is, it still can't be transacted easily. Or there's you know 10 minute transactions. It's like have a little imagination. You know mm -hmm. the hard problem was solved. Now we have to go commercialize it. Like what other technology has not gone from uh, clunky to you know seamless and ubiquitous? Um, and and you know one one example that I use for people that are in the gold world, it's like you know they 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 view like Bitcoin keys. Uh, you know, that can be lost. You know, like, like, you know, early in the days where people had gold, there were gold, you know, ships that sunk that had gold on it and you're never getting that gold back. You know, mm -hmm. so like, yes, the gold exists in, in, in the world, but you don't have access to it and it's no longer a utility to you. It's like, if my Bitcoin key gets lost, there's still Bitcoin in the world, but I just can't get access to it. It's like a gold bar that's soaked to the depths of, you know, sunk to the depths of the ocean. It's no different. And what we're in the process of doing now is, especially through multi-sig in, in various different ways. And again, this is a, this is a, you know, ruthless trial and error. And people, you know, like we go from the world of Mount Gox and people quote lost their Bitcoin to the world where people then figure out, oh, we need to be self-custodying our Bitcoin. So they move to single keys. And then, and then people say, oh shit, my Bitcoin's worth a lot more. Uh, I, there's some risks related to these single keys. I need to start, you know, storing them in multi-sig. And so we're really in this stage onboarding people onto Bitcoin and figuring out how to secure it so that it does have that permanence. 
but those are all just in, in the natural progression of the evolution. So, 100%. And that, you know, the fact that it can be lost is more of a feature, not a bug, just in that it makes it way easier. It makes it way less confiscatable. You know, gold, even if it's not, you know, centrally stored, you know, for, for security reasons, let's say it's just in your home or whatever. I mean, if somebody wants to run up on you, I mean, it's just a matter of force uh, versus, you know, Bitcoin it has a, a far deeper uh, security model because of that reason. Yes, it's a double-edged sword. It does mean it can be, your access to it can be lost, but it dramatically increases your ability to defend. And that's a whole part of the, the narrative around it. Yeah, and I think that's the idea. That's also an idea that, that people probably don't appreciate. It's the idea that if not for that, you know, permanence of loss, we wouldn't have digital scarcity. Um, that, you know, you know again, the whole piece of value of digital scarcity is I can send some, I can send Bitcoin to somebody else and, there, and, and once it's gone and once the network confirms it, there's no taking it back. Or if I have a Bitcoin stored on a key and that, that key is lost. Now somebody may find the key in the future and be able to access it, but it is destroyed um, and it doesn't literally exist anywhere in the world. No, no one's getting that Bitcoin. Um, but that, that is uh, a feature, not a bug, and that we wouldn't have digital scarcity if not for that. That underpins the idea of digital scarcity. Um, that you can't, you know, recover, you know, an email from a server that's, you know, on, you know, G Gmail server. It's just the Bitcoin, you know, only exists and, and, and it's controlled by single keys. And if those keys do, are not held, nobody in the world can get it. And, and if you didn't previously make a copy, you know, that, that, that's on you, not on the network. The, ne the network will get stronger because it learns from those, you know, situations. Um, you know, people learn from Algox. They don't hold their, you know, people still do hold Bitcoin on, you know, Coinbase to the world, um, which may be good for, you know, someone that's just starting out. But, but people learn from each, you know, each mistake. You know, Bitcoin's a living, breathing organism. Um, and, you know, you know, in trial and error and just in time and experience, we, you know, we figure out how to optimize for, um, issues that, you know, kind of cause problems, you know, three, four, five, six years ago. Yeah. This is the last point about gold, and it's, I'm going to use it as a segue into kind of how things look in a Bitcoin denominated world. But, it, you know, it is something that a lot of gold bugs and even kind of, you know, well known macro guys say a lot. And the gold bugs will say, you know, um, well, on the one hand, gold is valuable because it's scarce. On the other hand, but we don't want, we don't want absolute scarcity because that little bit of supply elasticities allows us to, you know, normalize prices. And um, is, it's, it's, a, it's a weird argument that doesn't, you know, really um, flow for me, but I was wondering if you could touch on, you know, and even if you don't want to touch on that argument, but just looking at what prices look like in a world where the supply side is inelastic and obviously all all changes in demand have to be reflected in price and uh, you know, what kind of, how that affects the functioning of things in a world if that were the standard, you know, because, and you know, a lot of the macro guys would say Bitcoin can't be currency because it's inelastic and you know, it's too volatile. Um, and I think those, those arguments probably haven't been thought through too well, but I'd love to get your take on them. Yeah, so I think that at least, on, I mean, I don't know the, the idea that, um, because if you argue that, you know, a small amount of inflation is good, um, it's like, what is, what is the actual principle that you are argue on, arguing on? And you, you're basically making a, a, you're taking a position that is some source, the person who's mining the gold or creating the money, um, has a role to play in setting prices in real economic, you know, kind of in terms of the real economy and real economic activity. And that once you figure out that, you know, the role of money, it's, you know, kind of like the concept of price is something, you know, and I think you brought it up before. And I think, it, you know, the whole idea of money and the, the concept of how price evolved, you know, Hayek talks about it as, you know, you know, it, you know not of deliberate design, but that, you know, if it were that it would be viewed as, you know, one of the greatest achievements of the human mind ever invented. Um, yeah. But that, but that, you know, it wasn't, you know, der derived through deliberate design or conscious thought. And so therefore, you know, it, 
it, it, it's something that's so impactful, but that no one really, it's not taught in school, you know, it's just kind of taken for granted, it's there. I think in the future that will change once we go through this period. But once, once you get to the point where you understand, because I think it's the most important piece of Austrian e economics, or, or really any economics, is, is the, you know, the role of money in the function of price um, and, the, and the pricing mechanism, and that you know, money is there to intermediate other, other exchanges. You know, it basically says, you know, there's two exchanges. I, you know, bought, you know, produced this, I sold it for Y money, and then I needed to buy something else, and I, you know, bought that for Z amount of money. In both of those, I'm pricing both the money and the good. Um, but the real thing that money allows us to do is that wouldn't be possible if there wasn't, you know, X and Y and Z and, you know, A, B, C, D, E, and F goods to, to trade for that money. And so um, really what we're learning through price and, the, and the, the really valuable piece of information is the relative value of all other goods. It's not the amount of money that is meaningful and it's not the, the value necessarily of money that, that we want to know. We want to learn how many cars does it take to, to build a house? You know, how many apples do I need to sell to buy a car? Um, and, and that money being the intermediary, all that, all that happens if some outside force is creating money is, is introducing a variable that is unnecessary to that equation. Um, and so, um, you know, if you're, if you're taking the position that a small amount of inflation is good to quote, normalize um, pricing, it, I think it fails to understand what price actually is. There is no price, right? There's prices ever changing. It's really exchange ratios between hundreds of millions of different goods, you know, buying between billions of people in different locations that have different preferences. So when, when price is quote changing, it's because people are, are, are through money are expressing, you know, what they value. Any outside manipulation just comes to distort that, that inherent level of activity. Um, and then on the side of kind of low levels of inflation, it's like, well, how do you choose what the right amount is? You know, like, why not, if, if 1.5% is good, why not two? You're not really making a fundamental argument. You're just kind of creating an explanation for the way things are, in, in, in my view. And then really for those people that think that Bitcoin is too volatile, uh, to be a currency. I think, again, that's one of those places where, um, you know, I don't want to be insulting, but, you know, it's, it's, again, you know, a level of, you know, lacking imagination to say, okay, like, forget that Bitcoin is volatile. Determine in your own view whether you think finite scarcity has been achieved in Bitcoin. Develop a view as to whether you think it's uh, technically, practically, socially possible that there are only ever going to be 21 million Bitcoin. And if you can get there, then one, you're not going to have the view that Bitcoin's too volatile. But even if you do, you'll recognize the value in it. And you'll say, okay, if I, if I recognize that a small number of people have figured out that this secret, maybe the world's greatest secret, that there's this resource that's finitely scarce and you can you know, take that property of scarcity and transmit it over the internet, um, that they will then see, okay, there's only 2% of people that have this thing. And there's 98% of people that, that don't. And that, you know, the way that people figure out about Bitcoin is when its price starts to rise, uh, because, because the people that have figured it out at a fundamental level are accumulating it. And more and more people are constantly doing that because knowledge is distributing over time and exponentially. That you, if you have a fixed supply and there's an order of magnitude of adoption, which naturally there will be if only 2% of people have it and you understand why that you know, nature of scarcity is valuable, that you can't have anything but volatility. Like volatility is price discovery. If, if you know, 2% of people were valuing something one day and then you know, the next day, you know, over a, a year, 20% of people are valuing it. Well, the, the, the new people may be you know, ascribing different value to the old people. They may have different amounts of wealth. Um, and so the price of Bitcoin has to readjust. It can't just naturally get on a fine line, um, you know, where, where everyone suddenly agrees. Um, but what happens over time is there's an adoption wave, Bitcoin 
rises by order or uh, by an order of orders of magnitude. The many of the people that were buying it don't yet understand it. And then many of the same people sell it. But again, if, if adoption increases by an order of magnitude, if only 10% or 20% of people figure it out, then your holder base is actually doubled, tripled, quadrupled. Um, so you don't need, you know, you know, many people that got, you know, sucked in to actually figure it out to create, you know, a, a more stable base or a base at higher levels. And that's where, like, when I see the volatility, to me, it's kind of become rhythmic, like it's explained in, in, in how Bitcoin is adopted. Um, but then, but then also, you know, people that have that view that Bitcoin is too volatile, they just have to recognize, you know, economic reality. If I hold Bitcoin and I recognize that it has a fixed supply and nobody can create more of it and it's not held by many people and more people are going to adopt it, all while I can spend my dollars that the Fed has printed 2.4, created 2.4 trillion of and that will surely devalue. So long as I can continue to use my dollars and spend my dollars, I'm going to continue to do that and as people, as more and more people have Bitcoin, as the as the density of the Bitcoin holding population increases, it's you know again it's not going to happen all at once, but you know increasingly you're going to start to see people pop up. Like the first part to wanting to accept Bitcoin at a at a shop is figuring out why you should be holding it and saving it. Um, mm -hmm. So the problem is many people want to be paid in Bitcoin. Not many people want to pay Bitcoin, right? <laughs> because they can pay a depreciating asset and save an appreciating. Asset. So it's like, on the one hand, volatility is natural. On the other hand, once you figure it out, you, you don't want to spend your Bitcoin. That's perfectly, that's a perfectly natural and logical position to take, um, kind of given the other monetary mediums that you have to your availability. Yeah, I mean, I just see it as being, keeping the price signal as, I see absolute scarcity or, or finite scarcity being a mechanism that, that keeps the price signal pure. And far from being uh, detrimental to a monetary system, that's kind of the holy grail of a money in, in a, being able to preserve a pure price signal. Because we see time and time again how distortions of the price signal create a lot of different problems. Yes, in gold, it's relatively mild. But I would still say if you analyze it closely, you'd probably be able to, uh, you know, determine or reveal that that ultimately is uh, a drawback. And then... You know, as you mentioned in today's world, and this is one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, is um, what's being done to our money now. You know, people are hearing these words, trillions being thrown around, all the debt that that's, uh, governments are taking on. And, you know, I think they're, they're starting to realize that, okay, you know, we'll have to pay this back at some point, or, you know, how can the government afford to send us all a check? You know, these questions are starting to seep in. I don't think people appreciate how the price signal is being uh, manipulated uh, and, you know, maybe even destroyed or, you know, being uh, a lot of the price signal is taking a lot of abuse and what that means. And one of my concerns is, um, you know, in a complex uh, economy, globalized world in which we have, you already have a lot of issues. Uh, with the price signal based on how each central bank, you know, issues currency and the inflation and then the interplay between global currencies around the world. But then when we have this much uh, printing of money and liquidity being injected into the system and the interplay of all the debt that's there, my concern is that uh, my question, and maybe you can shed some light on this, is what are the tells or things that we should be looking at um, because I think for, for the price signal to break down in a manner that dramatically disrupts trade. So it kind of becomes too um, disrupted to facilitate, you know, um, trade that we need. Now, I don't know if that necessarily coincides with, you know, currency collapse or if, or if just the, the kind of uh, turbulence in the price signal be precedes that and becomes such that it just continues to disrupt trade. And, and what I'm, what I'm talking about here, I guess, is, you know, things like food shortages and, and things of that nature that rely on, that are very, very important that we all rely on, which those rely on a stable price signal to, uh, to be optimized and to, um, you know, to provide us the things that we need. So what, what's your kind of take on what's happening now and how it's distorting and the negative effects it's having on the price signal? Well, I, so I, I think that the, um, you know, the first thing that I kind of recognize is that 
you know, again, that idea that, you know, if we look at the price of oil or, or, or the price of gas, you know, the national average of the price of gasoline, realistically, you know, every gas station, or not every gas station, but most gas stations have a different price, you know, for, um, for gallon gasoline. Um, and that there really is no, there, there is no single price of gas. There's no, there's no single price of anything, you know, banana at a store, you know, next door to me versus five miles away is going to be different. Um, but that, you know, kind of the function in aggregate is allowing all those people that are, you know, directly facilitating trade to, you know, manage their own supply chains and manage their own business models and their own cost structures. Um, and that, that, you know, it's not necessarily like what, you know, with the Fed creating 2.4 trillion in, in the last six weeks or six, seven weeks, it's that you have to recognize that since, like, that this problem goes back decades and that the, you know, it really accelerated in the financial crisis in 2008, but that, you know, the, the transmission of the manipulation of pricing mechanisms generally is affected through the credit system. So people, one of the questions that many people have is like, you know, Fed created, you know, Fed quintupled the size of its balance sheet following the, um, following the great financial crisis. And, you know, why didn't we see inflation go, you know, why don't we see prices go up 5x? Um, and, and the reality is, is because the way that price is typically communicated through our, you know, fiat monetary system through the allocation of credit, through the credit system. Um, and so um, what the, you know, but, but the consequence of that is the way that the Fed manipulates the money supply. And, and again, you can't look at it in a vacuum as just like, what is the cause and effect of, you know, this 2.4 trillion is, you know, before the financial crisis, what was the consequence of doubling the money supply over, you know, a decade or two? Um, because what happens is, you know, and, and, it's, and it's easy to think about in a specific example. So like what happens when the Fed manipulates the price of mortgages? Again, you know, during the financial crisis, we had a housing problem um, and, and a housing crisis. And the Fed, you know, effectively went and bought 17% of all mortgages. They bought 1.7 trillion in, in mortgage-backed securities. Um, which hold the mortgages, which are actually owed by, you know, consumers and businesses all, all over the country. Well, when you manipulate the rate of interest lower for, for housing, then the entire economic structure shifts. So um, more people and more resources within the economy are devoted to housing and construction of housing than they otherwise would have been. Well, what happens when the market figures out that that, that world was unsustainable? Um, and this is, there, there's a really dense um, lecture that Hayek gave called um, The Pretense of Knowledge. So I would suggest reading it. It's dense. You probably got to read it five times. But it's idea that these, these, these price levels in housing can only be sustained so long as they're manipulated. And soon, as soon as the, you know, everyone figures it out that they can't afford things at those levels, then there's, it's very difficult to find the equilibrium because, no, you know, because, because it's been ma manipulated for so long. Um, but it's not just but it's not just the price. It's like thinking about, well, shit, over 10 years, a bunch of people devoted their life to you know building houses. And because there was a price set on those houses that could only be achieved if the Fed had created 1.7 trillion dollars to keep home values high. And and again, it's not just like the, the nominal level of homes, it's it's the the exchange ratio between a home and a car and every other good. Uh, and so when that happens, you ultimately get mass economic displacement because it's, uh, it, it's manipulated the balance in an economy. It's, it's created a skills mismatch that can only exist so long as manipulation exists. Um, and manipulation can only exist for so long until everybody figures it out. And we figure it out in these periods of shock. And so what I look at in terms of, and so when I think about, well, what is the Fed doing now? What are the consequences? It's, well, there's 75 trillion of debt in the United States. Before they started doing this, in, in terms of the banking system, there was only about $1.6 trillion. And, and if you added in the money that's held at the treasury, there was about 2 trillion. So there's, there were 75 trillion of liabilities, the fixed maturity, fixed liability debt. 
Now, when they increase the money supply, if, if you just look at the banking system, not money that's physical outside the banking system, and I, I don't look at that because it generally can't be used to pay mortgages and uh, to pay auto loans. It's the you know kind of the money in the banking system servicing the liabilities in the banking system. That you were in a scenario where the the, the amount of debt outstripped the amount of dollars, thir still you know thirty to forty to one. Uh, so when the Fed creates two point four trillion dollars. There's still way too much debt that can't be repaid, and the people, you know, and the way that they interact with with each other, you know, even you know, myself or yourself, we have deposits at banks, and those po deposits are credit ultimately, um, and but but then there's credit cards and there's home loans. So realistically, everybody owes so many dollars, and on a relative basis, still very few exist. That that's what's driving what the Fed's doing. What it's essentially doing is attempting to, and, and, it, and it's identical to what they did in the, in the great financial crisis, they were attempting to prevent the collapse of the credit system. Uh, the only way they can prevent, and, 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 the, and the only way they can do that is by manipulating the money supply. Too much debt, you need more dollars to be able to service those debts. Well, what happens? The, the sectors of the economy that are more heavily dependent on credit ultimately have their, their, their prices more manipulated than, than other areas of, of the economy. And so I expect the exact same thing to happen here. What they're doing is they're trying to, to maintain the size of the credit system uh, because if the credit system starts to contract, which it's not doing yet, but if it did, then it would just feed on itself. It's, it's so levered that you know, each default would just be like dominoes fall. Um, and, it, and it's very hard to, to force correct. And so they're putting all these dollars in the system and what will happen is they'll continue to put dollars in the system until they stabilize that credit system. And then the credit system will start to expand and then the effects of the monetary debasement will be felt over time rather, all, rather than all at once. There will come a day where everyone will feel it suddenly. Like, the, like I do have a view and I, you know, it's not a dystopian view and I'm not draconian. It's just I'm you know, living in reality that you know, if you increase the, the supply of money by you know, 2x, 3x, 4x, 5x, 6x, 7x, you know, today we're at you know, 7x what it was in 2007, that there will become a time where nobody values dollars because they've just become so abundant. But, but that won't happen realistically until either one of two things happen. They probably happen at the same time. Supply chains start to get disrupted significantly. So you know, people think about hyperinflation and they just think about the money side of it. It's really that the, the price signals have gotten so distorted and the, the, the credit system has stopped working such that you can't get the goods that you actually need. So hyperinflation is really a combination of you know, things becoming real things that you need becoming scarce because supply chains are disrupted. And Venezuela is the perfect example. While money is becoming more and more abundant, money is losing its actual scarcity because goods are becoming you know, uh, more scarce. Uh, and so the whole money only works in a world where, where money is scarce relative to all other goods. But if goods start to become scarce, then and, and there's more and more money, then that equation flips. Um, and so, you know, my, the, my markers are either mass unemployment and extended unemployment, which I think is a serious risk right now, or, you know, kind of, and that, that also is a function of like, when you have mass unemployment, then you don't have those people producing those tasks that um, created the goods on the shelf. So it's all, you know, an interrelated dynamic system, but, you know, I don't necessarily expect it in this cycle, though it is possible. Um, but really kind of looking at the signals of what is the credit market doing because that's really what the Fed is targeting when they are recklessly making, you know, 300, 400 billion dollars a week or 2.4 trillion over six weeks. Yeah, I, I've heard you touch on this before, you know, because we, we often ask ourselves or each other in this uh, Bitcoin space, you know, wh what's driving uh, fiat currency to to have any value you know what's what's propping it up effectively and you usually the the reason given is well legal tender laws people are you know by force quote unquote uh required to use it in the payment of taxes and and that kind of thing and of course there's you know the coercion that goes on around the world the petrodollar being an example where you know the might of uh, the u.s military in that case can go around and say price oil in our currency because you know, basically, <clears throat> they go around trying to drum up artificial demand uh, for the currency. And those are kind of the more obvious ones. But I've heard you articulate that this massive debt machine that that's, uh, you know, 
kind of rolling along um, aside us is is also requires it also generates a lot of demand for for the money and that kind of allows it to persist maybe longer than you might think and i think that's pretty much what you just touched on there um and i think we're all kind of wondering at what point that breaks down and as you said you know you it'll create those increasing disruptions in the function of money as it relates to pricing goods and services in a supply chain and there will be a breaking point at some point there and you know it'll probably be a domino sort of effect from there am i understanding that correctly yeah and so i think it happens you know and i think you cannot uh, divorce this discussion from bitcoin because it's a dynamic equation like when i talk about the world or the u.s financial system being highly levered it is an aggregate, but certain people aren't. And, you know, I think for those people that say, you know, the government gives money its value or, you know, they, they can create demand for dollars, right? They can tell me I have to pay my taxes in dollars, but they can't make me demand dollars. If I'm, you know, 60 years old and I've got a bunch of Bitcoin saved and, you know, I'm not earning, like I'm only paying taxes so long as I'm earning, but if I'm not earning, you know, if I, if I, if I just decide I'm not gonna earn, then I don't have to demand taxes for dollars. No one can, you know, the, the government and specifically the central bank, it can only dictate the supply of the currency. Like it, it should be very intuitive to somebody that um, like you can't dictate to me what, I, what value I put on a dollar. I literally go out in the world and price my dollars every single day. I decide to buy certain goods over others. Um, and I, you know, this, decide not to buy certain goods because they're priced certain ways. And so when people get, you know, kind of lost in the weeds and say, oh, well, you know, the petrodollar and they, you know, the government made them do that. They made them, or they, they reached an agreement, you know, I don't know if there was a gun to a sheik's head, but um, they made an agreement to do that, but they still didn't dictate the price of oil in dollars, right? They didn't still, they still didn't say, okay, you know, the, 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 you know, the do dollar price of oil, it ha needs to be fixed at, at $50. Like we see what the market's done to oil, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, obviously there's some technical things, but yeah, oil and the dollar value of oil are, are, are subject to supply and demand economics, just like anything else. And so I think that, you know, as it relates to like really that event of like when people stop valuing the dollar, it's, it's when sufficient people get over to Bitcoin such that uh, there's a universe of people that no longer need dollars in, in the same meaningful way that they did before. Yeah. Again, only 2% of people have Bitcoin today. And, you know, if you're just thinking about the United States, like say, and that, that number is probably a little bit higher in the United States, but in terms of any material exposure to Bitcoin, probably not more than 2%. Uh, you still need dollars. You know, like even if you don't have dollar denominated debts, you still need dollars to go buy the you know, goods and services that you need. But once you start saving in Bitcoin, the, the Bitcoin world is, is, is just very naturally less, like it's still wed to the dollar. Like people that are speculating in Bitcoin still have dollars, they still need dollars. So, it, you know, it's not divorced from that. But the more people that come into that orbit and the greater the density of people that have Bitcoin, the less people actually will need to interact with dollars. Um, and so I think that it happens basically twofold. One, as a function of the Fed, like if we go back in a series of time, before the financial crisis, there was about 52 trillion of debt and there was only about $350 billion in the system. So each dollar was levered 150 to one. Then through the financial crisis and through QE one, two, and three, the, the US, or sorry, the Fed created $3.6 trillion. Essentially what that has is a function of, of making dollars less scarce relative to credit, but it also only works if it causes credit expansion. So, you know, the Fed created $3.6 trillion, essentially delevered the financial system by putting you know, debt stays the same, more dollars exist. Uh, but then the credit system starts to grow as intended. That's, that's by design. That's what QE is. Um, and now today we lived in a world where there was 75 trillion of debt. So debt's expanded from 52 trillion to 75 trillion today. Um, and the, the, the Fed, again, if it understood what it was doing, it wouldn't have taken dollars out of the system because it would have recognized that it was still very levered. Uh, they just would have left the money supply the same. Um, but now when they you know increase the money supply again they'll probably get to a point where their balance sheet's like you know eight to ten trillion dollars which means that they'll have to have added six to eight trillion uh each time that happens the amount of actual dollars relative to debt becomes less scarce 
and there are more people that have more dollars that aren't leveraged again because like you can look at this in aggregates and say oh that shit each dollar in the u.s financial system today is levered you know 17 to 1 like again before the fed doubled the money supply in the bank and the treasury it was 35 to 1. Uh, and so it, it really happens as a function of that recognizing that the system is still very levered it's much less levered or at least in the sense that there are way more dollars relative to the debts but then if you look at the cross sections within that economy there's many people that aren't indebted and that, that aren't over levered and they're sitting there looking at the world and saying this doesn't make any sense it ends badly and then there's this thing over here, Bitcoin, that has a fixed supply and it can't be manipulated. And so, you know, pe people, you know, one thing that people need to recognize is that each time a dollar for Bitcoin is traded, the exact same amount of dollars exists and the exact same number of Bitcoin exists, at least when, it, when it's traded on the secondary market or when, it, you know, Bitcoin's used to buy any goods and service. And so all that's happening is collectively the market is setting you know, the preference for Bitcoin over dollars. And so in that way, you could say, you know, the dollar is already hyperinflating as it relates to Bitcoin, but purchasing power for goods and services is still holding. When a sufficient number of people come over and figure out that Bitcoin provides this better form of money, that's really when the dollar has its problem because people, as they move over to Bitcoin, they're getting out of other financial assets, which causes the asset values that support the credit system to, to, to have downward pressure, actually causes the dollar to strengthen initially. Um, and then, and then, but the, the, the more people do that, it actually will induce a more aggressive and more consistent, you know, QE from the Fed to a point where, again, you get to a world where a sufficient number of people have Bitcoin that they can, they can exist in that world without relying on the dollar system. And that's probably when the dollar actually falls apart. Yeah. And that would make one think that there's going to be substantial politicization of Bitcoin because some people within the existing system will recognize what you just articulated. Now, maybe it'll be the case. Hopefully they will. Or may, maybe hopefully they won't, but, but presumably some will. And, um, you know, maybe it's the case that Bitcoin will continue to kind of do its thing and it'll hijack people's greed in order to kind of do its bidding. And maybe that will mean that the pushback is less severe. But, you know, I know you, you kind of you interact with uh, people in that world and people, you know, certain people of influence or you have done so in the past and stuff. What do you expect in terms of um, when the scenario or the reality that you just articulated is recognized by uh, those people, you know, for lack of a better term, government? Uh, what, what kind of a response are you expecting? Yeah, you know, I think I think it is something that very naturally will be politicized greatly, right? You know, yeah. you know the people who say that the government will try to ban Bitcoin, they're not wrong. Um, and no, I don't think that the United States government will try to ban Bitcoin. I think that, yeah, um, they're pro you know that that will be the first inclination. But then when they go through the 4D chess, um, I, I think that they're more likely they're they're more, they're more mischievous than that. You know, they they the the want to the want to control Bitcoin, you know. Again, this comes back to the idea of taxes. Just like you know, governments tax what's valuable. Something's not valuable because it's a tax. Um, that you know, if, if they recognize that this is a problem, the first kind of you know inclination is to to ban it, to end it. Like let's get rid of this. Then you go through the process because these aren't unintelligent people. Um, they say, "Am I really going to be successful in banning it, or do I just you know add fuel to the fire?" Um, and wouldn't it be better to co-opt it and control it than um, than ban it? Mm -hmm. uh, now they won't be able to do that, but like that'll be the, the schemer's thought process. I think um, there will certainly be like there already have been congressmen that's come out and said, you know, we need to ban Bitcoin and things like that. But I think in terms of you know actually having any sway uh, or sufficient kind of public motivation, because again, this only happens when Bitcoin is owned by an order of magnitude of more people, you know, like probably doesn't happen until Bitcoin's worth, you know, I, I don't, there's like some, there's probably something that happens when Bitcoin crosses a trillion dollars. I don't think that will happen then, but there, like, there will be a triggering that like, this is a, this is a problem for some people. Um, and then, but, but it probably won't be until it's worth two trillion or three trillion when they like really kind of get organized to try to do something. Um, and at that point, you know, so many people are going to have Bitcoin. Uh, by definition, like the value won't be higher if more people don't have Bitcoin. 
that you know the the public opinion or even members of Congress that own Bitcoin, um, you know, the states will certainly be at odds to all of that, um, you know, or certain states will be. Um, so I, I, I think about it, like, I don't spend, a, I recognize that it's an, an eventuality, but I also know that it's like, if, if something is such a basic necessity and such a valuable resource that, um, and, and as Bitcoin has shown, it's just, you know, it's like Bitcoin routes around every problem and if you say, oh, well, this, is a, this will be a much larger problem, it's like, well, Bitcoin will be much larger. It will be, by definition, much harder to control. It will be a much more global um, phenomenon. It, you know, it will be more dense within each market, and it will be held and, and operated and owned in, in, in many more markets than it is today in terms of uh, you know, um, regulatory jurisdiction. So um, I, just, I, I just don't worry about that you know, kind of because it's, gets back to that question it's like okay if that even happened it only happens in the world when you know bitcoin it you know has a, a much much larger purchasing power and and then knowing what i know about why that's the case it's for those same reasons that any ban or anything to um, stamp it down will only you know kind of fuel the fire uh you know it could certainly you know a headline could make the price go down or the value go down but it doesn't change its actual long-term value so. Yeah, I want to circle, circle back one sec to kind of uh, the dislocation that uh, we're currently seeing based on the monetary system we use and the manipulation. Um, you know, I, I I see if we go to kind of a future Bitcoin denominated world where it's the the, the monetary standard all over. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, you know the the price inelasticity, and so you know presumably in a world denominated in a currency that has that uh, quality that prices would tend you know downward you know, there, there would be you know deflation and you know and the the volatility argument i think is solved if you just zoom out and you realize we're in kind of a monetization phase but once it's evenly distributed in my mind at least i kind of see you know the the growth in the price of bitcoin roughly mimicking you know gdp growth because if there's more goods and services there's that roughly equal demand for the currency to transact in them but because the currency is inelastic and the, the value is generally going up prices should should come down and so you know first of all i'd like to get your take on that but i'd also uh like to you to one touch on how debt works in a bitcoin denominated world because it's one of those issues that often comes up and then you know f final capstone on that what's just you, what kind of a world do you imagine how, how do you believe the world is different in the in, in the, the biggest differences that we might see being on a standard of money that uh, let bitcoin represents that's a big, that's a big that's a big one I yeah <laughs> so I, I think the credit ones I think easy I think uh, yeah there will still be credit uh, there will still be debt like there will be Bitcoin denominated debt and there will be you know equity um, you know shares of stock that you know are traded in Bitcoin uh, I think that you know both of those things are going to be much much smaller than they exist today um so you know and, and it will all come back to the the fact that you have a fixed money supply that can't be manipulated like yes somebody could rehypothecate collateral um to a loan and they could have this kind of form of of of, of money creation but at the end of the day that all that is doing is creating asset liability mismatches and so you know it can't exist on a systemic level because while it's possible to still rehypothecate bitcoin uh it's like if if you fail, there are no bailouts, you know, or if there are bailouts that, you know, some entity actually has to be capitalized uh, with Bitcoin to do that. So that either comes from, you know, real, realistically, it comes from taxes. Um, so it's not to say that there, there can't be bailouts, it's just that bailouts have to now be expressly paid for. Um, but that, you know, be, because of that, it's like I view a world where, again, the credit system will still exist, it will just be smaller, as soon as you know the credit expand system expands too quickly, it won't be allowed to be sustained for long periods of time. I think that the you know similarly there will be you know uh, you know joint stock companies, um, but I think that people are going to figure out that if they just have a good form of money, that this whole idea 
this whole bill of goods that we, we need to make our money grow will, will have turned out to be a lie. Um, and the people will figure out, it's like, wait, no, I don't, I shouldn't be put in a position where I have to perpetually be taking a risk. Like I already took the risk. I in, you know, invested my time to do some job and I got paid a form of money. Like I can take that money and take risk and be paid kind of a fair market value for it, but I shouldn't have to in order to pay for my life and my retirement type world. So I think that there's something very kind of perverse about kind of this, this mindset that as soon as you make money, you're supposed to go invest it in somebody else's company that, that, you know, so there'll be more people that save. And, and, and that's one thing that, that people don't recognize is you know, more people say, if there's a fixed money supply, how do more people save? Uh, there's just the same amount of money. It never changes. Uh, and the reality is that if more people were saving, that everyone would have a smaller share of the money supply. And so it's not necessarily that you're, quote, increasing the amount of Bitcoin in aggregate that's being saved, it's that you're getting it more distributed such that when we get into events like today, that, you know, 80% of people have to be bailed out, that people have those reserves such that they can, they can go a month or two months or three months, God forbid, four or five years without, you know, needing to, you know, they have enough money, quote, in their bank account that can pay for longer periods of time. Um, and so I think that it's a, it's a definancialized world. Um, it's a world where there still is credit, there still are stocks and bonds, but that, you know, it's a much smaller system because people do figure that exact thing out that, you know, in a world with a fixed money supply, uh, the, the purchasing power of Bitcoin will increase over time, but it will be likely unnoticeable, you know, from day to day uh, or even from month to month, you know, you know, and, and it may even be so slow that, you know, you don't even recognize it over years, but it will essentially track the increase in productivity. And I kind of have a visualization that's like, if you just have, you know, kind of a flat line, that's the 21 million Bitcoin, and you imagine a city growing up, kind of, you know, just being, you know, using that same 21 million, that, you know, everyone's doing more jobs and there's more things, uh, the money is becoming more valuable, but it's also being more effective for the holders of the currency. They're being delivered more goods for that. And that works for everybody. In that environment, the person that's producing the thing that's getting the money is getting something. And the person that, that has the money that's getting a good is getting something. It's just allowing for more effective coordination. And so you'll essentially have, uh, you, you, know, you probably won't have business cycles. You will have periods of you know, greater growth and lower growth. And, and there's, no, there's also no definition. Like people say that Bitcoin is deflationary. It's only deflationary as, so long as capital is being accumulated. And that's what people need to figure out. It's like, so you're telling me that deflation could, or if this is your position, not yours, but like the people who argue that deflation is bad. You're telling me that if capital is being accumulated, which would in the Bitcoin world be what would drive inflation, or sorry, deflation, that that, that is somehow a bad scenario for everybody. How is it a bad scenario for anybody? The money has a greater purchasing power. You know, somebody is willfully doing some job to, to, to build some capital and form some piece of capital that delivers a good that someone that with the money is demanding. So everyone in, in the economy that's looking around and they say, okay, I need to get some of that money. I need to produce something of value in order to be able to get the money from the people that have it so that I can then go buy things that I want. That, the, that, that, that deflationary world, again, only exists if it's working. It only exists if there's a successful state where capital is being accumulated. Because by its definition, Bitcoin is neutral. If capital is being consumed and there's the same amount of people, then prices are going to go up in that world. So if, if, if capital on net is being consumed and there's the same amount of money, you would have an inflationary environment. It just so happens that if you have a world where the money supply can't be manipulated, that you're going to have increases in productivity and, and that economy is going to function better so that you are consistently going to be accumulating capital, to create that quote, deflationary pressure, but it wouldn't be deflation like we think about it today, because when we think about deflationary bouts, and the reason why the Fed is so fearful of it is that you know, deflation in the Fed's world isn't driven by productivity gains, it's driven by a collapsing credit system. And it's something that can drive you know, prices to collapse of like things that you think were otherwise stable by 10% or 20% you know, in a matter of months. Uh, and so 
their deflation is a systemic issue related to the credit system. And, and, it, and it's right in the sense that if they did do nothing, that credit system would, would collapse. But in the Bitcoin world, again, deflation will be driven by, you know, at least in steady state, will be driven by um, the, you know, you know, increases in productivity, which will effectively be kind of, you know, reflect you know, increases in GDP as it's defined. Um, so, you know, it, it's very difficult to know what that future world looks like because preferences have been manipulated for so long via the current form of money that we're going to have to go through a, a period of time and probably a difficult period of time. Like, I don't think that there's any way that the, the, the dollar can destabilize or the, the U.S. credit system can collapse without some like serious repercussions to all of our lives. Um, that even if we're transitioning to a Bitcoin world and seeing light at the end of the tunnel and being optimistic because of that, there's just, there's no easy transition off of a world of excess to a, a more sane reality. Um, but that also means that we can't predict what that Bitcoin world looks like because you know, the, the distribution of the currency will probably be far different. The preferences of society will probably be far different. And, and uh, I think, you know, it will be great, but I don't know what it looks like. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm inclined to agree with you. I think it, it will look really great. But as you say, that transitionary period is, is the sticky part. Um, anything, you know, beyond the obvious, you know, stack your sats, protect yourself and your family that would prepare that you think is, is important in terms of preparation for what seems to be an inevitably, uh, perhaps turbulent transition? No, I, I think that it's, you know, read the Bitcoin standard, you know, get, get up to speed, you know, hold your own private keys. Um, I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's recognizing the value of savings, you know, like kind of have, have enough savings so that you're, you're never put in, it's kind of, you know, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. Um, kind of like learn, learn from what's happening all around us now that we, you know, we need greater redundancy. Um, but then at the other side, it's, you know, I kind of have this view that, you know, at some point there's going to be a really difficult period in, in the United States or in the world if, as, you know, because I strongly believe and I don't think it's a crazy view, but that the dollar does destabilize at some point in our lifetime, maybe even in the next decade, um, because it is, is, it is dynamic related to Bitcoin, but that not to be worried about that world, you know, and not to, to you know, stress out about it, but just to figure out more kind of like how you can get one foot in front of the other and, you know, do something that actually adds value that you enjoy. Because if you're doing that and you're contributing that, you're going to be, you know, you're going to be fine, you know, uh, you know, but, but, but without that, you know, it will, it will be really challenging. So it's like, how do you figure out how to, to not be paralyzed by some kind of impending challenge versus just continue to move forward and, and, and being able to like focus on that. Again, that's kind of a esoteric concept, but I think that that's really what you have to do. You have to be able to focus on the day to day, uh, and not worry too much about kind of what happens in the future, but being cognizant of the general direction so that you're prepared for it. Yeah. And, and having, Bit having Bitcoin is probably, you know, you know, there's, you know, beyond the things that you mentioned, like stay safe and take care of your family, like preparing for that world. It's like, you're going to need Bitcoin to buy things in the future. Um, yeah. And so you're trading it for, for more dollars. You're, you know, you may be playing the wrong game. Totally agree. I think that's that's very well put because I think we all question and and in light of the last couple of months, it's really brought to the forefront. It's probably shifted the timeline forward in terms of how many of us thought this was all going to play out, and it's caused us to think, oh man, this this you know this could unravel maybe sooner than we might have thought. Um, and what's the best approach to take? And you know, like like you said, I think it's it's important not to be consumed by the fear of, of what may transpire and focus on things that you enjoy, where you can uniquely provide value, which you can also, uh, you know, gain value and, and enhance your, your own situation and, uh, you know, be cognizant, be prepared and take necessary precautions. But, you know, I'm, I'm always in that, like, I don't want to invite the big, you know, tumultuous, like world is going to hell sort of thing by over, you know, by, preparing overly for it. So I think we, we had to f strike that balance of engaging in the solution while we simultaneously, uh, you know, prepare for uh, what, we, what we see coming on the horizon on the negative side of things. Yeah, it's like, you, you, yeah, you, you have to have faith in people 
And one of those things that makes me so optimistic is, is again, I don't look at if the world goes into some sort of depression, I don't view it as a zombie apocalypse. It's a lot of people having to, you know, struggle, you know, and it's not, this isn't pre, pre, you know, prescriptive because I also think about myself, it's impossible for me to envision myself and, you know, kind of, what, what does it actually look like? How does it actually impact me? You know, it's, it's kind of, it's unknowable. Um, and, 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 you know, being aware of it is one thing, being rendered, you know, kind of paralyzed because you are in fear of it is unproductive. Um, and so, you know, when you, when you think about the idea, and one of the things, again, that makes me so optimistic is you look at something like Bitcoin and it's just somebody had that idea and then a lot of people contributed to it very early on that made it go from you know, nothing to something. Um, and that type of ingenuity, I think, you know, one of the best things about it is it will, it will ultimately, again, I think it will ultimately lead to a more balanced economy. I think, you know, it's like, if you, if you look at the, if you look at any fallout from this dollar calamity, it's that, you know, connect the dots that there is something related to it, um, you know, as it relates to, the increase in the money supply and the manipulation that there is some connection to that that, that that a lot of the imbalance exists because of the you know there's a cause and effect there and that in a bitcoin world with a fixed money supply um, that there will be the ability for or not the ability but there will be a natural course that will cause the money to be more balancedly you know more distributed in a more balanced way and that what that ultimately means is that you're going to have more people contributing to the kind of melting pot of ideas contributing to the economy, you know, expressing their preferences, and that that future will be, you know, by definition, because of that, you know, kind of more valuable and, and, and you know, more positive. And so it's kind of like, we have to get to that pain point in order to get on the other side of it, you know? So that, that's one of the other ways that I think about it. It's like, until that moment comes where, you know, we're, you know, we got to go through a draw, you know, whenever, you know, the, 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 the drug addict, you know, isn't actually living until they go through the withdrawal you know, type of an idea. And I think I, I view it similarly with, yeah, there is going to be some, some, you know, consequences or, you know, there are, we're already seeing the consequences and it likely does get worse, but you know, that's the natural part of healing. So I don't yeah. stress out about it. I, I totally agree. And I think we have to be grateful, you know, to use the analogy, we, I think we do have to kind of, we will go through a withdrawal and then we'll get better. And I think, I can't imagine a world in which Bitcoin didn't exist because there would be, I <laughs> mean, wouldn't. what do you do? I mean, the, the, the withdrawal kills you in that kind of a world. And, yeah, that's um, Venezuela, you know. Yeah. And, and Venezuela will not die, you know, but it's like saying, like, that's what happens when you, like, it, and, I think, and I think about it not like just p pointing or picking on Venezuela, but it is that if there weren't other monies that existed that, were, that continued to operate, Venezuela would be even in worse shape, right? Yeah. Like there wouldn't be the ability to coordinate economic activity to get humanitarian aid there, whatever it may be, but it would be definitionally worse. And that's how I think about Bitcoin. If, if say the, the dollar went, every other fiat currency goes. Um, it's, it's the last of all, even if it's, you know, kind of creating money more, rec, you know, kind of recklessly. Mm -hmm. um, and so if there wasn't Bitcoin, and, and people could say, oh, well, we go back to gold. It's like, no, it doesn't work that way. But if there wasn't Bitcoin, then we don't have the system to reboot. You know, we don't have the, the ability to get to rock bottom and then realize that we're you know, no longer at rock bottom type of a scenario. Um, that, that, that money really is that core function that allows for us to, to, to bootstrap out of rock bottom um, or, or at least you know, maybe rock bottom is not fair, but to, to get to a point where then you start to, you know, marginally see things improve, that money is really the thing that allows for all that coordination that, that allows for improvement in the first place. Yeah, and I'm probably saying this because I spoke with uh, Brandon Quidham last night, but, you know, Bitcoin being that kind of mycelium that decomposes the, you know, the, 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 the dead system which fell on the forest floor and, as, and repurposes all the energy there and from which emerges you know something new and something better so it, analogies abound of course but yeah just extremely grateful that uh, we're not looking at a, a black hole on the horizon and rather you know a ray of light that we can engage in and, and try to 
build something better on top of. Um, Parker, I could legitimately talk to you for another two, three, four hours because uh, I feel like we've barely scratched the surface, but I, I, know, I, I know you're a busy guy and I'll, I'll let you go now in a second. We'll, we'll have to put a pin in it for, uh, for round two. But uh, I typically finish this off with just a quick set of uh, the, the rapid fire questions. So it's a couple of questions and then it's a few word associations at the end. Are you down for, for doing a couple yeah. of those? Sure. So you can, pat, you can pass on any of them if you don't want to answer them um, and take as long as you like to answer. The, the, first, the first group, there's 10 quick questions and then the last is just a 30 second word association sort of thing. Okay. So the first one is, and probably the, uh, the most involved, but uh, what is money? How do, you, how, how do you define money? The function that coordinates all other economic activity. If you had to explain Bitcoin to a 10 year old, what would you say? There will only ever be 21 million. What does Bitcoin succeeding look like to you? Everyone in the world using Bitcoin. Best resource for learning more about Bitcoin? The Bitcoin standard. Any other investments that you're interested in? I own cattle. Nice. Uh, what's one piece of advice you give to someone just entering the space? Read a lot. Is there a movie or song that song that's most related to Bitcoin in your opinion? Uh, the bull began his run. <laughs> Can Bitcoin be stopped? If so, what is its biggest vulnerability? If not, why not? Uh, collective action failure. What is something about Bitcoin you don't understand very well uh, and you'd like to spend more time on studying? Pass, I misheard the question, so I can't answer it. <laughs> uh, when, if ever, do you think the first central bank will uh, add Bitcoin to the reserves and will they exist in 20 years? Next five years, so yes. What have, what have you learned about yourself or how have you changed, if at all, as a result of learning about uh, and interacting with Bitcoin? I focus more on the present. Um, and, you know, find myself, you know, wanting or demanding fewer things of luxury. What is your most controversial or contrarian view or opinion? If nothing on Bitcoin, any subject is fair game. Oh. Um. Pass. <laughs> Ballpark estimate of Bitcoin's price in five years. Um, stock to flow model. If Bitcoin were to fail, you wake up tomorrow, something is broken, irre irreparably so. What's your, you know, what do you do? What's your reaction? How do you reorient your yourself? I figure out what the money is that, that is working. Um, would you sell all your Bitcoin to see it succeed? Trick question. <laughs> all right, last part, word association. I'll just say a word, you tell me the first thing that comes to your mind. Democracy. Our government. The Lightning Network. Uh, great potential. Government. Keeping the people down. Human rights. Um, freedom. Violence. In some ways, human nature. Trump. President. Ego. Natural. FOMO. Human psychology. Wealth. Not needing things. Privacy. Uh, critical. Hate speech. Doesn't exist. Gold. The best form of money before Bitcoin existed. Guns. A right. Revolution. Uh, natural to the human condition. Socialism. The devil.
family? Uh, the most important. Inequality. Um, human creation. Hell. Your own mental state. Liberty. Um, the, the greatest cause. Energy. Uh, the root of all other goods. And Bitcoin. Future of money. Parker, man, really appreciate the time. Really enjoyed this. Uh, before I let you go, is there anywhere you wanted to direct people, whether Unchained or your own personal stuff or anything like that? Uh, you can check out my series, Rather Than Suddenly, if you got questions on you know, various different topics. I try to you know, hammer home a single topic that's either you know, something that people don't understand a lot about Bitcoin or just a, a fundamental view. Uh, Phenomenal check us series, out. for sure. Yeah, check us out at unchained-capital.com. Um, if you need multi-sig vaults or you know, if you need loans, just check us out. Check out Caravan. Um, yeah, but uh, we're, we're easy to find on Twitter. I am as well. DM's open. Um, shoot me questions. Um, and yeah, look forward, to, look forward to the future. Well, man, I really appreciate the time and the work uh, in your writing and the work that you guys are doing at Unchained. I think it's a huge contribution to the space. So keep it up and uh, I look forward to connecting again in the future. All right, awesome, John. Really appreciate it and look forward to coming back on sometime. All right, buddy. Take care. See you. See ya.